lecture today, but the internet is controlling us. Literally, so, but we're nonetheless going to listen to our excellent speaker and fine colleague from the Department of Engineering and Science who is going to be speaking with us today about the technology that goes into the, uh, the web and also the cloud. And he's going to talk about whether or not those things provide opportunities for control or for liberation. So please welcome Dr. Marie Fireman from the Department of Engineering and Science. Hi, I am so sorry. This had never happened. Actually, tell us something. Um, anyway, thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Fadi, and I am uh, one of the faculty members in the Department of Engineering and Science. Uh, basically, what I uh, my area of study is uh, telecommunications and networking. And uh, to that end, obviously, most of the courses that I teach are related to either communications or networking, cell phones, wireless, that kind of stuff. So we basically study how cell phones work, how the internet works, and what are the enabling technologies that they can actually make the internet work better. That's basically what we do. And uh, so the reason I'm here today with you guys is to share some of my thoughts with regards to, uh, first of all, some critical issues which are related to the internet and uh, cell phone technologies. To that end, we would like to know, for example, uh, what happens when you send an email and what are the consequences of the way we communicate using these mobile devices. And the more we communicate, what is it that we are actually doing and what's happening behind the scene. So those are, with that, uh, I'm hoping that we can, we can actually uh, bring up some of the critical issues or in interesting issues at least from different points of views and kind of uh, just chat and see how you think with regards to an important question which is are we actually um, are we at the stage that internet technology is actually giving us more control or are we in some ways we're actually this internet is actually take or technology or communication technology as a whole is actually taking us under control so we kind of like to discuss that and see what, where are we with respect to that important question. So I must tell you, by the way, before I start, I've done this a couple times here before in the same classroom. It seems like you guys are the most interesting crowd, mainly because the way you're sitting and the way you're looking. So uh, I think you're off to a good start. Anyway, um, before, before we start answering that question, I think uh, we need to kind of establish a couple of basic concepts. One of those is what exactly is the internet and what's, for example, information technology as a whole. It turns out that information technology is yet just another, another technology. It's automation, for example, nanotechnology, agriculture, food processing. It's just another technology. But what's interesting about information technology is some of the basic characteristics that comes with it. First, exactly what does this information technology do? Um, the first thing that we need to know is the basic idea, the underlying concept of IT is basically allowing us to get this raw data and process that, store that, digitize that, and in some way generate useful information that can actually be used in various aspects. So to that end, what information technology does is basically offering us what we call information processing cycle, which is like getting the raw data, processing it, making useful information out of that raw data. Now, what are the different characteristics of information technology? One of those is that it basically converts everything into what we call the digital data. Once everything is converted into digital data, it's relatively easy to manipulate, store, and do different things with it. In addition, another interesting characteristic of information technology, which is very unique to IT in compared to other types of technologies, is that it's also being used by all other technologies. For example, in your car, it's automation technology, or agriculture, or nanotechnology, all of these, they all have to deal with data. That data needs to be communicated, processed, transferred, etc. IT is the enabling technology for all other types of technology to actually process their data and understand the data and create new and processed information. 
So IT is basically being used by all other areas and technologies. Now, the enabling technology for information technology as a whole is the internet. So internet is basically the infrastructure which allows us to actually utilize the IT, the IT technology. So this information technology that we have, it's running over an infrastructure which we call that the internet. So it's the internet that allows us to store, access data remotely or find out, communicate and learn about the data and exchange that data. Now, in addition to the internet, as you know, there's this World Wide Web technology. World Wide Web technology is the technology that provides services which is on top of the internet and allows us to actually obtain a lot of different services. So what do you mean by services? All these, for example, chatting, getting directions, shopping, reading the news, uh, all of these are different types of services which are provided to us through this technology called World Wide Web, which is basically sitting on top of the infrastructure which we call the internet. Now, it turns out that the access to the internet services happen to be something that has had evolutionary path. It started with these gigantic computers, which you may not see very clearly because of lighting, but the basic idea was they had these gigantic, very large, mainframe computers. You had to actually schedule your time to be able to access them. Later on, the basic idea was, well, why don't we allow people to have their own individual computers and the concept of personal computers or PCs kind of came into the market. After that, they were saying, well, if you have PC, why can't we actually take it around and move with it as you go from one place to another? Why does it have to be stationary always hooked up to your desk? And then with that came the concept of laptops. And then after laptops, as you know, it came cell phones or these handheld devices, which the concept is to be able to access information at any time, anywhere. So where we are right now, we started with this mainframe, we went through this PC promising the individual freedom, and then laptops offering mobility, later we came into smartphones. Today, almost half of the users are using the handheld devices or smartphones to actually access the internet. So we use these devices to effectively communicate and use the internet. Something like 10 years ago, it was primarily we were doing it with PCs. So, what's happened now is that we all have these handheld devices and we pretty much do everything with these devices. We chat with them, we read our email, we read the news, we check the website, we do shopping, we send emails. Everything we do is basically being funneled through these handheld devices. In fact, in 2014, it's estimated that there are 1.75 billion handheld devices that are actually globally available to people. So, and this number is supposed to be doubled in the next three years. That's almost 35% of all the people in the world having cell phones, which is pretty interesting. So what do we do with these cell phones? What do we do with the internet? Well, there are a lot of cool things we do. And there are, it's kind of astonishing as to how we use the handheld devices. But maybe one of the most interesting statistics that I actually read, in fact it was last week uh, in Time Magazine, it was saying like, Americans spend 22 hours per day using their cell phone. Which if you think about it, it's like, how exactly do we spend 22 hours per day using our cell phone? That means we drive, we eat, we even sleep with them. That's the only way that we can actually spend 22 hours with our cell phone. Now, so you can kind of see that, you know, if you actually you don't have your cell phone, it's going to be a problem. Dead battery is kind of like having dead social life. And this is definitely something that we have to avoid. But how did we actually get here? How did we actually get to a point that we really can't use, can't live without using a cell phone? Well, what happened is that initially when the internet is kind of going back to the history of the internet and where it came from in the early 
of 60s and by 70s people were actually using the, the internet as a whole, uh, it turned out that internet was actually thought of as a technology of liberation. The idea was that it actually promises using the internet in the future for them back then, back in the 70s, it was actually a promise to have a cybermetic metal, metal. So the idea was basically we have this virtual reality which allows us to have these technological paradox. We would have a heavenly city which with that there will be no constraint in terms of what we send, the type of information that we exchange, who we talk to, etc. So it would be completely liberating us from all the physical constraints that we will have, we typically have, which is separating us geographically. Through the internet, we can all get connected without any constraint. That was the basic idea. Now fast forward that 40 years later. Today, that is absolutely true that the internet has actually revolutionized our lives and it's actually empowered us in many ways in terms of education, the way we study, healthcare, commerce, selling, marketing, advertising, all of these are true. But at the same time, one thing that has happened is also the fact that it has become an instrument of bureaucratic monitoring and profiting. For the rest of this talk, I'm mainly going to talk about how it has become a tool to monitor. And how is it that they actually monitor our activities? But before we actually understand that, it is important that we kind of see how the internet works. So I'm going to give you, and I hope you bear with me, just for five minutes, we just go over the basics of the internet and see how it actually works. So, this is useful because for many of us, we think we send an email, it's just virtual. There's nothing, nobody can actually figure out what you're doing, what you're sending. So we have this virtual concept in our head. And through the next five minutes, my point is that there's nothing virtual about the internet. Everything is real, everything is electrical, therefore everything must be, is physically available and it can be easily intercepted. So that is the point that I'm trying to point out. So let's start with how the internet actually works. In order to actually have an internet connection, you must have three things. One, what we call internet-enabled devices. Those are like laptops or cell phone devices that you have. Now, all of these devices, they have an address, an embedded address. That address is not changeable unless someone actually hacks it. Every single mobile device that you have, it has a unique address. That device, that address is unique to that particular address. The second thing we need to have is an ISP, Internet Service Provider. Those are the companies that actually connect us to the Internet, to the outside world. Now, how do they do that? They do two things. One, they give us a different address we call it IP address. That's the actual address that we get. And by having that address, we can communicate with other nodes over the internet. We can send email, chat, etc. But in addition to that, it is the ISP that can also provide services such as email, web servers, etc. So those are the services that are being offered by the ISP. The third component of, of the internet is the actual physical cables. Nothing happens if there's no cables. If you want to watch TV, you have to call AT&T or Verizon to actually give you a hardware. That hardware costs $125, it's real, that's where your data passes through. That hardware is connected to cable. Everything you do, everything you send, everything you receive is going through that cable. There is nothing virtual about any of these things. These are real data that is walking, running over that cable and it goes to your modem. Now, with that, the question is how exactly, for example, when we send an email, what happens? So if I'm sitting in my home and I just happen to have Verizon as my ISP, so I'm having this 
Is it Xfinity? I think it's Xfinity, right? Verizon has Xfinity. Yeah, so let's say I have Xfinity, I, have the ca I get the cable, and I also have internet through Verizon. So I send an email. Now, my computer is actually connected to the modem. Now, it could be wirelessly connected, it could be actually connected through a cable, but somehow I'm actually connected to the modem box which Verizon has given me. So as a result of that, I sent an email, it first goes through the Verizon office, and then after that, they will direct my email through the internet, eventually it goes to the destination, that's where I'm, that's the person I'm intending to send that email to. But, what happens is that the email that I'm actually sending, it has some interesting pieces of information. Among others are those, remember those addresses that I talked about, what is the address of the hardware which is unique to your device, and the other one is the IP address. So this is just like sending an envelope, a letter within an envelope. What's an envelope? It's the source and destination address. The same exact addressing mechanism is implemented when you send any email from your house to anywhere else, from your station or computer to any other computer. Same thing happens when you actually check a web service, for example. You go to ssu.edu. The ssu.edu, when you actually send the request, you say, hey, I want to see that web page, you are effectively sending all your information, which includes the IP address and that unique hardware address embedded inside your hardware device. Now, with that, so for example, let's say I get an email. Let's say I'm using Yahoo email account. This is the kind of thing you see. I put my message here, but when you actually go one step further and then look at what is actually inside this email that I just received, and you actually look at the header or the envelope of that email, this is the kind of information which you get, which probably doesn't really make sense, but for people who study this kind of stuff, this information which is inside the header, and by the way, you probably don't see it unless you actually search for something like this, this information has the destination's IP address and that particular hardware address which is a part of your computer. So all that information is here. In addition to that, it also has information about how it got here, where was it originated, and which countries or cities it actually traveled through. So by looking at the final destination, at the, fine, at the header of the email, there's a lot of information that I can actually gather. An interesting uh, thing that we usually do in my class is that we actually have somebody goes and sends an email to someone else from an unknown location. The person will use that header to identify exactly where this was. This is kind of useful if, for example, your boyfriend, girlfriend, your spouse is saying, honey, I'm stuck at work and I can't come tonight. So you can easily actually check the email and figure out exactly where that person sent that email from. So things like that are so simple that anyone with very, very basic knowledge of, of internet can actually do that. So, with that, well, let's just look at some circumstances and things that can potentially happen. For example, you all know that Netflix and Verizon, they don't exactly see things eye to eye, right? Because Netflix saying, hey, come, pay, I don't know, how much is it, $10, $9.99, $8, 9 dollars $9.99, something like that. So you, the basic idea is Netflix says, hey, pay this amount, $10 per month, and you can see as many as movies you want. Verizon says, hey, why? Why don't you use my Xfinity or whatever service that I have multimedia or video on demand that I offer? So with that, Netflix, Verizon does not like us to use Netflix because they say, well, if you want to watch TV, use my service, right? That's the basic idea. So, if the law allows Verizon, potentially what Verizon can do is the request I'm sending to Netflix to actually demand for a particular movie can easily be blocked or thrown into trash or simply ignored. Why? Because every request that I actually send, it will go through the office of Verizon and, and their equipment. Therefore, they can easily block whatever it is that they would like to do. 
You've probably heard of the concept of net neutrality. The basic idea is through net neutrality, everyone has the same right to utilize these cables that are actually connected between us as consumers, the ISP, and the ISP and the internet. Now, if the net neutrality is not there, that means Verizon can easily choke those packets which are going to Netflix and basically just drop them, slow them down, or just make it such that it becomes almost impossible to watch a movie. We get tired of it, we say, hell with it, I'm not going to use Netflix. Why? Because it's just too slow. Right? So, what's the alternative? I'm going to use the Verizon because it's much faster, it's much better quality. So, this is right now, there's a lot of discussion about net neutrality. It hasn't passed yet, but the point is Verizon or any other ISP is in the position to actually implement such discriminations against packets going to their competitors. Now, basically, based on the same explanations that we've had so far, it, you should be able to easily see that anything, including an email that's basically going or getting its way to Verizon, can easily be opened up and read. Or Verizon can simply just send it into some of these big computers, which are, we refer to them as the storage servers. So they just record everything that's passing through them, just randomly. They don't even have to look at it. it just, they just record it. And everything that we do basically goes there. That includes, for example, Every time I actually watch a channel on my universe, at and knows the number of people or who, what movies I'm actually watching. Based on that, they can recommend other movies to me, right? So how do I know that? That's basically because they're collecting information on everything that I'm doing using the internet, which I'm utilizing their service effectively. Now, having, sending an email, like I said, is just like sending a mail in an envelope. The envelope has two pieces of information. One is the sender's information, and the other one is the destination information. Now, same exact thing happens to every single email or request you send to a web page. With that, there is actually two pieces to the information which you're sending to another person along with your email. That email is effectively divided into two pieces. One piece, we call it the metadata. That's the basic heading information. That's who, you, who are you, where, did you where, where are you, who, what's your address, and where are you trying to send this information to. That is called the metadata. Then the other piece of that email is the information, we call it the payload. One of the interesting things about this whole internet concept is that the payload, you may actually secure that by encrypting it. So you can actually come up with these sophisticated algorithms and actually encrypt this thing. So even if I get your email, I open it up, but I don't really understand what this is. It's just gibberish because it's been encoded. But what's interesting is that this piece is not encoded. So it's kind of like your neighbor. You have these mailboxes. Everybody can see each other's mailbox at home when you get mail. Your neighbor does not open your mail, but they can easily look at the heading of your envelope. If your neighbor keep doing that, and every day you get a DM and email or mail, your neighbor actually looks and records who you're getting the mail from and who you're sending mail to over a year period. What do you think he finds out? He's going to find out a lot of information. Who are you talking to, first of all? What kind of associations do you have? Are you sick or not? Because if you send, if you send, if you're getting bills from hospital, that means you probably were in hospital, right? If you're sending, if you're actually getting mail from your dentist, that means you probably went to your dentist. There's, so there's a lot of information that by just looking at this metadata, just simply as who are you, where are you sending your mail to, and where are you getting your mail from, by just simply getting that information. For a long period of time, there's a lot of information that we can actually get from a particular user. In fact, there's actually a very interesting project. It's called Immersion Software. This has been developed by MIT Media Lab. But the purpose of this software is that you run this software on your Gmail or Yahoo account. By running to this, it creates a graph. Each graph represents the person you have been talking to. So, this one is Rachel. This is my email. 
This is Rachel. It seems like I exchanged a lot of email with Rachel. It happens that I also, this is Kristen, and I also send email to Kristen. But seems like based on the type of emails that I'm actually sending, it, it, reveal, it reveals that Kristen and Rachel are also connected to each other. It seems like they also know each other. So based on that, you can come up with a very comprehensive graph which kind of, in a very comprehensive way in fact, shows everyone else, the, the person who is actually looking at all my connections, it kind of reveals who I'm talking to and what kind of connection I have with different people. That is the power of gathering this metadata. And that is what people who, or organizations, which gather these metadata or record whatever we're sending and going through, they can actually figure out without even looking at the content. Now, so how does it work in the real world? Well, in the real world, you're sitting at your home and you're connected to Verizon or AT&T, let's say. You send email, you check, you check web pages, you do all kinds of stuff. You actually go on Google, you search for things. Every time you do any of these actions, that data can easily be stored into something called the storage server. In addition to that, that data goes through the, your ISP. Sometimes you actually use Facebook, you use Gmail, you use Yahoo, Hotmail, whatever else utility or service that you utilize. If the communication that you have with that server is also recorded in their servers. So for example, you go on Facebook and you're describing something. You actually tell your friend that I bought this particular product. That information can easily be recorded. And that's exactly how we get these targeted advertisements. For example, I'm looking for red hats. I go around and I'm searching for, so who's got a good, nice red hat that fits me? So, as I'm going around and I'm doing searching with Google, you know, I may or I may not find something. But next time, next day, I actually go to Times Magazine and I'm reading the news in Times Magazine website. And all of a sudden I see this red hat popping up. How do you know? It's because all of these activities that I've had, it's been recorded in these servers. And it just happened that there are these advertising companies, such as DoubleClick is the name of one of those companies. It just happened that this company was actually, in actual, all of these servers, they sell this information to the advertising companies. So for example, Facebook, uh, Yahoo, even Gmail, for example, all of that information is basically can easily be accessible or sold to these advertising companies. Now, so it can be pretty obvious that by having access to this kind of information, we can, they can actually find a lot about us. They can figure out our shopping pattern, the, the behavior that we have when we are searching for things. With that, it can easily, one can easily conclude that this kind of approach can be used to manipulate the, or influence the way we shop or even impact our action in terms of the things we bought. It is not surprising that last year Google spent $3.1 billion to purchase DoubleClick. Why? Because of this immense power that they have in order to be able to access to all of the information which are gathered by these companies. Now, we said that we are using these mobile devices and everything we do is basically being funneled through that new device. Everything we say, all the notes we get, even the way we study. If you're using Moodle and you're using actually cell phone, effectively somebody can figure out the pattern of your study. There's actually a very interesting app, perhaps you've seen it, it actually tracks the way you scroll up and down or left to right. And based on that scrolling, it tells you whether it is you or somebody else and it actually identifies the person based on the way they scroll. They scroll the window. And that effectively is nothing but figuring out exactly, I mean, they, they, they use it by just looking at, so instead of having a password, all you have to do is just to scroll up and down. And you kind of decide whether it's you or somebody else. Now, what you're doing as a result of utilizing our mobile phone so much to that extent is effectively we are digitizing every piece of information that we have. By digitizing it, we actually leave digital tracing. 
By that, we mean that we are effectively now disclosing our connections and pretty much every data that we are interested in or we use. Now, that makes us extremely traceable. Now, yes, internet has changed a lot, but the fact of the matter is, it is also increasingly being used to monitor and control. Now, I, from now on, I want to point out that this controlling and monitoring that we're talking about, it effectively is in two different domains. One of them is by the government. Governments use internet and these technologies as a way, in spite of, all, you have to remember, this is in spite of that revolutionizing our life, that the impact, the great impact that internet has had on our, on our life. But at the same time, now we're looking at a different, we're looking at it from a different point of view, and that's from controlling and monitoring. And we are basically saying that controlling is done in two domains. One is from the government point of view. Governments are interested to control because of their citizens and other adversary governments. Corporations are interested to control and monitor because of who? Their employees and their consumers. Why are, you, why are they doing that? Well, corporations, for a very justifiable reason, they just basically want to sell. The bottom line is to get more money. So if I actually monitor and influence the buyers, I can sell them things that I'm actually, I actually have. So as a result, I basically increase my profit. So that's their justification for monitoring. Governments, on the other hand, they use it for pretty justifiable reasons. For example, they say, well, we're living in a very tough world. There are terrorisms all over the place. There we have to preserve our own independence. Therefore, it is important to protect ourselves. So national secu security becomes a major issue when it comes to being able to actually trace people. On the other hand, protecting national laws, such as pornography, or illegalizing it, or, you know, like, for example, gambling, all these other stuff, which basically governments are very much concerned about. Now, what I would like to point out at this point is that I'm kind of focusing on the government monitoring and see how it's done and what are the examples of this and how has it been affecting us and how we can deal with that. So, again, none of these things is basically saying that it's good or bad. I'm basically just pointing out the facts and the way it is. There is no opinion here. It's simply how things work and how the internet is being used as a way to monitor different people, different organizations, different governments. So it's often said, and I'm sure you have actually heard of it, that internet is definitely a tool of liberation. The issue here is, if you go to any oppressive government, you know, oppressive country, with oppressive government, if we figure out how to actually reach, make sure that the internet reaches that country, it is definitely an unstoppable tool that leads into freedom and democratization of those people and the country. That is a very common statement that we have heard many, many times. For example, examples of that are, I don't know if you remember, but it was a couple years ago, there was a green movement in Iran. Twitter happened to have a key role in spreading out what's going on in Iran. Another example is the Saffron Revolution in Burma. It was a YouTube, because people started putting stuff on YouTube showing what is going on. And right before that, it was basically the color revolution of the former Soviet Union, which effectively it was a combination of cell phones and the internet. So the idea was, or and is, in many people's view, that once you actually make internet available to all the countries, especially the South and so-called third world countries, then all of these countries will actually become democratized. But the fact is, governments are not really afraid of internet. The problem that governments have, especially in oppressive government, is that they want to be in control of the internet. They're not, they have nothing against the, the internet. But they're saying the internet is got to be in our control. That's exactly the reason China is actually threatening that I'm going to be off the internet and I'm going to have my own internet. I don't have to be connected to your internet. It's my internet, I create mine. Iran, as one of the countries, they have actually come up with their own version of YouTube. 
They say, hey, you want to put picture? You want to put movies? Put it on Messenger. Why don't you go to some, some other company which is owned by foreigners? Use this. Now, why are they interested in that? Because they have complete control over their own YouTube. That's the reason. So, the governments are basically saying that, hey, let's use the internet, but use the internet version that is mine and I have full control of it. So, with that, we can actually control the... I think it just ran out of battery. Can you hear me? Alright, maybe even you can hear me better. Alright, <laughs> oh, can you hear me? Guys in the back? Good. I rely on you. So if you don't hear me, let me know. So I know how far it goes. Great. Beautiful. So, the idea here is that using the control element that these governments have over their own internet, it allows them to read the blogs, it allows them to see what kind of emails are going back and forth, the same way that we described Horizon does. What makes Saudi Arabia? to stay away from controlling the internet. If in Saudi Arabia, the whole internet is actually being, con being controlled by the government, they do exactly the same thing as any other ISP is capable of doing, which is basically just looking at every single packet that goes along the cable, right? So, and that's why you hear, like, for example, a lot of bloggers in China, places like Cuba, or maybe Iran, are getting arrested, right? So, the fact is, there is a very strong element of control of the internet that exists in these countries. Now, one of the things that is important to understand is that this does not only, is not inclusive to only oppressive government or governments which we think they are bad or adversary to the United States government. In fact, over the past last six months, Google has received more than 32,000 requests from different governments to remove or block certain contents. So, how do governments actually deal with things that they don't like over the internet? Well, the ones that control the internet, they just shut down and just throw away things they don't like from the internet. The ones that they don't directly control the internet, such as the United States and Europe and etc., they actually go to those corporations and they tell them, hey, I don't like this content, bring it down. Google says no. They say, okay, what we do, we're just gonna close your account. You, or you cannot, that's what China does to Google. For example, if you go to China and you type in Tiananmen Square, which was a long time ago, 10, uh, I think about 12 years ago, there was actually this, uh, this riot of people against the government that's interested to actually make some reforms. And then at that time, a lot of people got killed, etc. But now, if you actually go to China and then type in Tiananmen Square on Google, you don't really get much. Why? Because the government of China told Google, hey, when people search for Tiananmen Square, don't show them. Don't say anything about what happened 10 years ago. So why? Why does Google have to be complicit to this kind of request? Because Google has an account. There's money involved in this thing. If Google doesn't obey what the government does, Chinese government, they simply close down their office. It may not be as simple as I'm posing this, but it's a still a question of authority. And that authority in no internet company is can actually stay away from that kind of authority when it comes to a law which is implemented by the government. So, this is not only asking Google, for example, to throw away or remove certain content from their website. In many countries, including Spain, Canada, Thailand, Turkey, there are countless of cases which different countries, they just go to the website or web servers on their ISP, local ISPs, and they actually ask them to remove or completely destroy digital content with respect to certain types of information. For example, um, in, uh, what's interesting, in Thailand, for example, there were about 100 videos over, the, over YouTube that they were insulting the monarchy in Thailand. The government of Thailand went to YouTube and said, hey, I don't like this thing, move that. So, they don't necessarily move it from the internet, but they make it 
not accessible to the people who are living in Thailand. The same thing, for example, in Turkey. Turkish government went to Google, or went to actually uh, YouTube again, and they actually asked to remove these videos, which were supposed to be insulting the founder of the Turkey, uh, also known as Azatur. So you see, the governments are basically doing their best in order to censor the internet. Probably the most vivid cases can be found in when it when it goes when it, when we talk about Saudi Arabia. Uh, Saudi Arabia every day, every single day, there are more than one thousand requests for removing things from their website. So they basically say, hey, I don't want like this, I don't want like that, I don't want like this. So every time you go to one of those websites, you get something like this: that this is an illegal website and you shouldn't be there. With that, I don't know if you're using. Do you guys use WhatsApp? <coughs> Do you? Yeah, you. I was expecting all these hands on you. So WhatsApp is one of those pretty cool applications. You can actually send messages. You can kind of talk to each other offline. Now, what happened in Twitter last year, in June of last year, uh, Saudi Arabian government told WhatsApp that if you want to do business in Saudi Arabia, you got to make us, the government, complete access to your servers. Everything you say, every message you send from one person to another goes to those servers. Those servers must be totally accessible to the authorities from the government. What does that mean? That means basically everything that people do, if you're looking for someone, the first place you can go is what's up, server, and see what people are actually doing or saying to each other. Now, along that, this story, last year, something interesting happened. There was this guy who happened to be a contractor with the um, National Security Agency, NSA, and it just happened that this guy sort of started taking all this information and giving it to some news authority. This guy's name happens to be Edward Snowden, which I'm, her I'm pretty sure you've heard of, right? Right? Yeah. Yeah. Regardless of whether you like him, you don't like him, you call him trainer, you call him hero, regardless of that, I have nothing to do, I mean, the, the topic here is not about defending anyone or excluding him, like to actually give him credit. But what's interesting is the content of those documents that he actually revealed. Based on those content, there were a lot of interesting information that actually came out. It turned out that over the last 10 years or so, the NSA and its equivalent called the Government Communication Headquarter, otherwise known as GCHQ, they have been snooping around, they have been using other corporations such as Google, Microsoft, etc. to actually get information about individual citizens and even governments. So, these programs that they developed, the cost was easily half a billion dollars a year. So what were they doing? They came up with this very massive internet surveillance programs. There are many programs that they are out there. If anybody is interested, you can actually go and read about this. But some of the most interesting ones are the following. For example, PRISM. PRISM is one of those programs that basically allows the government to have these bulk data collection. So just get the data. Whatever that passes through your server, just record it. Just record it. We'll figure out what to do with it later. But what is the piece of that data that could be used, even though the data is encrypted? You should know by now. Remember? The metadata part. What's in the metadata part? The information. Like where did it come from? Where is it going? All that header, all that information is actually embedded in that metadata part of the packets or information that they are intercepting. So the idea behind the PRISM program was to basically just gather all this information and do the data bulk collection. Another one was actually called Tempora program. The Tempora program, there's actually these fiber optics which connect us to other continents, like whether it's Europe or whether it's somewhere else. So NSA decided, hey, you know, everything that passes through this cable, why don't we just copy it and put it in our server too? So now we have two copies. One which goes to the final destination, the other one actually goes to our server. So we have, again, we have a copy of every transatlantic communication that's going on. 
Another interesting program is called Tao. Tao was basically targeted towards, towards foreign government, including even the governments which are supposed to be friendly, such as Brazil, Germany. I don't know if you heard about it. Like uh, Chancellor uh, Merkler was very upset when she found out that U.S. was actually snooping on her cell phones. Cell phones. There you go, personal cell phones. So she got really. Really, really upset that why the United States is actually snooping my own personal cell phone. So, what's happened is that many of these programs are effectively looking at gathering the data and utilizing information to figure out who is doing what. That is effectively what the purpose of all these massive internet surveillance are. Now, uh, another very interesting revelation that recently happened is called the ice search. Ice, uh, it's actually icy reach. Have you heard of this? Anyone? Yeah, this was actually revealed about five months ago. So icy, icy reach is a Google-like web page that's only accessible to government agencies, including NSA. So government agencies that are more than a thousand different government agencies that they can actually go to this website. So it looks just like Google, but it's called IC Reach. What it does is basically you can actually go and you can find out, you know, remember all those programs, the massive internet surveillance program that they were just recording the data and just putting it somewhere? Through this program, you can actually access all those servers and figure out information about particular individuals that you are suspicious about. That individual, is, is, individual does not have to be convicted in anything. If you want to find information about someone, you basically just go to this iReach uh, website and you actually start collecting data. What kind of data? It used to be that you could only look at the metadata. Metadata includes who is sent, who, where is it coming from, where is it going, so there were only limited information in the header that the government agencies were actually supposed to access. But through the IC Reach program, there are a lot of other program, other parameters that government agencies can actually access via those metadata. That includes cell phone conversations and headers of the cell phones. That a similar program was actually also developed by the government of the United Kingdom. That program, it has many elements. A couple of those elements that I thought is interesting to share is one is called the Miniature Hero. The, pro the purpose of the program is basically to record every single thing that people say when they are having a Skype session. Everything you say via Skype, by the way, who owns the Skype? It's Microsoft, not right? So everything you actually, so there is no way that they can actually get this program running without the collaboration with the Microsoft, right? There's no way. So the idea is basically everything that we do, that they do through this program, they can potentially record all conversation, including the messages that you send via Skype. Another one is the mount, which is a tool, set of tools. So there's actually this, uh, I don't know if you use it, but there's actually this gigantic website which is called archive.org. People put all kinds of stuff, all the, uh, upload, download, a lot of information. It's very, very comprehensive. It's kind of like Wikipedia, but kind of like you can actually put your information. It turns out that through these tools, they can actually go and figure out who is doing what exactly, what kind of stuff have been downloaded, who is downloading what, and all that information can actually be revealed. How? Again, by going back and looking at those hidden information that we talked about. So, let me just kind of give you, put, you, put, a, put all of these things in perspective. There are 7 billion people in this world. McDonald's sells 300 billion hamburgers since it's stopped. NSA has collected over 850 billion pieces or records of information since its existence. So you can kind of see 850 billion records, 7 billion people. You can kind of see what the share of each person to that record or storage will be. Now, 
You know, Jay Lennon once said that I'm glad the government is shut down. He was kind of referring to a couple of years ago, it was last year, right? The government was like a short period of shutdown. He kind of said that, you know, I'm very glad the government is actually shut down. They asked him why. He said, because this is the only time that I can be safe and no one is actually controlling my conversations and emails. Now, this is actually kind of true because what is happening is that the from the international point of view, the image of the United States government and UK government are being tarnished by the way we are actually snooping around and trying to record or to collect all these information. What's happened is that in 2003, when Obama wanted to become president, there was this notion of change. In fact, he actually came, his ballot was running on creating a new change. A change which he believed that at that time, with all this stuff that's going on with war in Afghanistan, war in Iraq, by him becoming the president, he can establish a great deal of change. That's why when he actually went to Germany, when he went to Berlin, over 150,000 people gathered and they were happy that he was there because he, they believed that he is going to change the way we operate. They believe that there is going to be a serious change. But only five years later, that slogan completely changed. And now what is happening is that people are basically saying this is just continuation of the same basic policy. What's happened is that we are no longer, we are no longer in the position to actually tell other oppressive governments that they should not snoop around their own people or gather information about their own people. What's happened as a result of the US policies is that a lot of companies, especially those companies who are actually in the business of cloud and data gathering, they are being hurt. Why? Because other countries, they don't trust these companies, American-owned cloud companies, because they believe they deal, they make deals with the government, and they reveal all that information. Because of that, it's actually a news that the companies which are involved with selling the cloud, cloud computing services, they have lost 22 to 35 billion dollars only within the last several years. And that economically is going to hurt us. Now, with that, the question is, well, what do I care? It's like, I don't have nothing to, I have nothing to get for you. There's nothing I do. All I do is just pick up a cell phone and just talk to other people. It's like, there's nothing. I don't even care if they actually listen to me, figure out what exactly I'm saying, etc. That makes you. But the fact of the matter is, the question is always that how secure is this information that NSA is actually collecting? By own NSA admission, after almost two years, they still don't know exactly what Edward Snowden has actually gotten, how much of information he's had, and how much more is left to come. They still don't know. In many, many cases, they have actually proved that many NSA agents, they use those stored records to spy on their spouses, on their girlfriends, and boyfriends. This is something that Time Magazine, actually, there was a story on that a couple months ago. The point is, it's not about gathering my data or your data. It's about once that data is available, how do you even protect it? How do you make sure this data doesn't go places that you don't want it to? And unfortunately, the government, NSA in particular, they haven't really been very convincing as to how they can protect all that information, even if they collect them in a very justifiable way. Now, uh, let me just read you this, uh, this, this short quote from General uh, Keith Alexander. Keith Alexander happens to be the, a former NSA director. They asked him that, is it the goal of NSA to collect the phone records of all Americans? He said, yes. 
I believe it is, the na- it is in the nation's best interest to put all the phone records in a lockbox that we could search when the nation needs to do it. So let's just gather whatever we can, and then we'll figure out what to do with it later. But until then, the question is, how secure is that data? And who really has access to all that data? Now, I don't want to leave anyone depressed and say, hey, from now on, I can't even use my cell phone, I can't use the internet. There's a lot of things we can actually do. One of those, and the most critical part of what we can actually do is to ask the right questions. We must be actually paying attention to um, how our data is being disclosed or what kind of privacy tools are available to us. And we must be very careful as to what kind of information we are actually revealing when we go on Facebook or Gmail or anywhere else. It is important to to understand that whatever we put on the internet can easily be accessible. The question is how much expertise is available from the other side to actually get access to those information and how hard it is. Do you have the right expertise or not? But we have to understand that any time you actually type something on your cell phone and you send it, that's going to stay there forever. Any picture you send out, it's going to stay forever. In fact, right now, NSA is actually coming up with this very sophisticated face recognition system which is going to run over the internet. The basic idea is it goes to every single social media, it grabs all these pictures, and based on that, whichever one it can recognize, it can associate the name and birthday to that picture. And all of that will actually go to a private server for, which is only accessible by the NSA agents. So this face recognition um, program that they're working on, it can really change the whole game. And the idea is basically just use the social media, whatever that's available. So to that end, I think it's very important that for us that we also start uh, defending and promoting national neutrality and public broadcasting and internet freedom. And at the same time understand that you know, support projects which really focus on democratizing the internet and making sure that our privacy is well protected. So with that, I like to stop here and I would like to answer any questions. Thank you. Yeah, I don't think this is something that is necessarily... Bo- so the question is, how do you feel about like United States giving up the custodianship of the internet? Um, first of all, let's understand what it means. What it means is that, first of all, internet is not like some wild thing that's just running without any control or any ownership. It definitely has ownership. The most important aspect of the internet, sh- internet is a name. Every website has a name. Where does that name come from? It comes from... Uh, a, an organization which is called ICANN. That organization effectively allows you to have a name. If they don't like you, they just throw away that name, you don't exist anymore. So there is an content, there's, a, a, there's an element of honor, ownership when it comes to the internet. But the problem is other countries such as Brazil, China, and many other countries which are relatively big with many, many internet users, they're saying, hey, you know, I don't like this. First of all, you have the control over all the naming. I don't like that. I don't want, because, for example, let me give you an example. When, there was a, when the war with Iran started, um, United States government just shut down access to all other government agencies in Iraq. So if I wanted to go, for example, to a website provided by the uh, State Department of Iraq, I couldn't, because the United States government basically just threw away all that access. Unless I know that, yeah, no one knows. So it's relatively easy to just throw away or stop someone from actually having the website. And that's what we mean, we mean by ownership. So other countries are saying, well, this is not cool. Because I don't want one country to be able to actually do whatever they want with me. On the other hand, there are a lot of countries that they don't even have English alphabet. If everything's in English, that means they have to learn English. Why do they have to do that if they want to use the internet? China has 1.7 billion people. 
people, why do they have to learn English if they want to use the internet? They have the largest number of internet users, right? So they're saying, why is it that the URL has to be in English? That's another thing that needs to be changed. So it's not a question of whether the United States is actually, whether it's happy to get rid of this ownership and democratize it and globalize it. It's kind of like, we are at the point that a lot of users are actually outside the United States. And with a lot of pressure, they're basically saying that it should be the United Nations that basically controls the internet and all these other naming issues and how you put characters in URL. By the way, they have actually solved that URL, so now you can actually use Chinese characters or Arabic uh, letters. Does that answer? Yeah. So if my information is online and not secure and the government is surveying, surveying or monitoring my how exactly does that affect you in a Nothing. I mean, it's up to you whether you care or not. But I'm just saying that if they start spooking around and actually get all everybody's information, the question is, where do they keep that information? And is it really secure? Who else? Yes, maybe these good agents are actually secure in this thing, but who else has access to these databases? And how many cases of breaching information do you know that people have actually, I mean, hell, Google has the largest, most secure servers in the world. Yet, Google has been hacked so many times. In fact, the security that's actually implemented in Google servers, I can argue that it's actually pretty good level, if not better than NSA's. So if Google is being hacked, what is it that it stops NSA servers to be hacked? So the question is, how secure can they have it? And also the fact that, hey, you know, if I have some sort of a disease, I don't want to tell the whole world that I have that kind of disease. It's my private thing. I don't want to tell everyone, right? So maybe some people do have their personal issue with other people being able to actually have access to my personal data. But on the other hand, the other bigger question is, it's like who else has access to that information? Yes? So if everything is So he's talking about Bitcoin. Bitcoin is kind of this virtual money that you can utilize over the internet. Many governments, many agencies are actually saying it is a good thing to let people to use Bitcoin. Because if you let people use Bitcoin, it's even easier to figure out how much they are spending. If you have cash in your hand, there's no way of telling what you're doing with the cash. But if you use everything, if you use your cell phone for everything, and you use Bitcoin on top of that, it's much easier to tell exactly how much you're spe how you're spending your money. So it's even a better thing. The question now, Gil, is how easy has it become to actually figure out who's doing what? So again, that's one of those issues that I think once we figure all the technological issue, it is actually better for government and other corporations that people will start using Bitcoin. As long as they figure out, okay, if you're using Bitcoin, then you have to pay the taxes, IRS share has to be determined. If you figure all those issues out, then it's actually a better thing. It's just like at the beginning, nobody, the government didn't like internet. Why? Because they didn't have control over it. Now that they all have control over it, they say, hey, use it more, it's better. In fact, put everything in Facebook. If there's a protest, write it in the Facebook. In fact, say exactly what time and where. That's exactly what they like, because it's good, because they can see everything. Remember I told you this is a much... Oh, sorry. Uh, yes. Any specific question? Right. So Tor network is basically the idea is, remember those addresses that I told you, like those IP addresses that everybody has an IP address, using the IP address you can tell who you are and where you are. Now Tor networks is like this set of computers, when you actually go to one of these Tor computers, 
the computer somehow, some magical way, hides your identity. So it passes your, your data to somebody else. And then it passes. So it keeps that IP address, which originally started with you. As it goes through these Tor networks, it kind of keeps changing. So by the time it gets out, you never know exactly who it was that actually sent it. Right? That's the basic idea of the whole Tor network. But here's the thing that a lot of people are kind of curious about. First of all, Tor Network supposedly was actually originated by the Department of, by actually Navy, U.S. Navy. Which basically people are saying, well, the people who originated, so the only question is, yes, it may work in Iran, or it may work in Turkey, or it may work in Saudi Arabia or Syria, for example. Tor is very massively being used in Syria right now, um, which all the opposition groups are basically using Tor Networks. But again, the question is, that's great, it works fine. But the question is, ultimately, the person, the, divide, the organization which, which actually created that, they still have access to that kind of information and they know how it works. So whatever we trick we come up with, there is always this, the question is, who has the answer to those kind of information hiding that you're actually performing? Um, let me just give you one example. Have you heard of Elo? Elo, it's like hello, but it's Elo, E-L-L-O. You know what it is? It's basically, it's becoming a replacement for Facebook. Very good. So the idea is Elo is claiming that, I'm sorry, do I have time? So the idea is Elo is saying that, every, in fact, they're basically saying every day they get 40,000 invitations, requests, to be a part of this. Why? Because people don't like Facebook. Why? Because Facebook is kind of telling people that you have to use your real name and information, your date of birth and so forth. So people are saying, you know, this Facebook business is cool, but it's just revealing too much information. And besides that, it's actually communicating with the government. So the government can easily come and get all that information. So Elo is saying, hey, forget about Facebook. Come to me. I will be your savior. And I will give you the security and privacy that you want. So there are a lot of people going and shifting towards Elo. The problem is, as one of the very, um, uh, as one of the professors in Stanford actually recently wrote, he basically said that, you know, this is cool. This is a very good advertising pitch. But the fact is, if millions of people all of a sudden go towards Elo, Elo becomes huge, right? When they become huge, they're probably going to face the same issue that Facebook actually confronted at some point. So what do they do? They change their policy the same way that Facebook is changing their policy. They're saying, well, you know, from now on, you have to use your real name because they have to make money. To make money, your other, the companies which actually sponsor advertising, they have to know who they are dealing with. So that is one of the key issues, the system, the way it is, you must play with the physical laws that exist on land. And that is basically just revealing yourself as who you really are. Uh, why is it that your profile? Why is it someone like if someone hasn't been on say for like three months and they're dead? You know, why would the profile like if you haven't been on for three months? But it's still so there. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's one of the policies. For example, the email from Gmail. Every time you delete something, uh -huh. it's deleted from your mailbox. You go to the trash, you delete it from your trash box as well. But in fact, that email actually sits on the server of the Gmail or Google for six months. Why? Because they want to make sure you know, just in case someone came and says, hey, I'm interested to see what this guy is doing. I have the conscious to be So it is actually sitting there. So in general, this is a common practice that whether you're there or not, your data actually stays there, whether you exist or not, whether you need your account or not, whether you need an email. That information stays there. That is a general policy. It stays there for as long as you 